We're in a sermon series that's taking a brief look into the life of Moses and some things that we can learn from him from the last few weeks of his life. And the setting is that they, the nation has finished their 40 years of wandering in the wilderness after not having faith that God could bring them directly into the promised land. And so they are camped on the east side of the Jordan River, and it's about time for Joshua to take command, and he's going to lead the people into the conquest. But during these last few days of Moses' life, he wants to pass on to them some things that he thinks are the most important things that they need to remember. And in fact, they are the most important things that they need to remember because it all is going to be bringing them back to being devoted to God, loving Him in a deep faith relationship. But it's, it's about Moses and these things that he is teaching them and helping them to understand. And when I think about Moses and the other people that the Bible teaches us about, there's so many encouraging things that help us from their lives, good things and bad things. You know, and think about Moses for just a minute. He, he truly was an amazing man that clearly had outstanding leadership abilities. But I think the most outstanding feature of his life was his love, his deep, genuine love for God. He met with God literally face to face. Well, I guess literally, at least to a limited extent, not to see the full essence of God. But unlike anyone else that Scripture tells us about, Moses met with God in, in a face to face encounter regularly to such an extent that when he would come out from meeting with God and talk to the people, his face literally glowed with the glory of God. And so he just had this really close, deep relationship with God, loved God very much, and passed that on the best he could to the people. But think about Moses' weaknesses for just a moment. He had some really big failures. You know, just before Moses left Egypt, he killed an Egyptian. He got angry over the way that the Egyptian was mistreating a fellow Hebrew, and he killed the man. He obviously had a problem with anger because it got him in some trouble later on as well in his life. But Moses, because of that act of anger and murdering the Egyptian, he had to flee Egypt. And he spent the next 40 years in the wilderness taking care of sheep. But then we come to the story of the burning bush. That incredible, miraculous story where the bush was on fire, but it wasn't burning up. And it was God speaking directly to Moses and telling him, I want you to lead my people up out of Egypt. But if you remember from that story, as amazing as that was, Moses came up with excuse after excuse of why he was not the right person to do what God wanted him to do. He was filled with doubt and fear at that point some pretty big failures once again. And then later, during the time in the wilderness, during the next 40 years where Moses was leading the people through those wilderness wanderings, and they were in a wilderness place without water, and the people began grumbling. And God told Moses to speak to the rock and bring water out of it. Well, I'm not sure if Moses got angry and frustrated with the people and he struck the rock because of that, or if it was maybe a combination of some pride of Moses beginning to think he was the one doing these things for the people and he struck the rock as a show of his power. But whatever it was, Moses disobeyed God. God told him, speak to the rock, but Moses struck the rock. And because of that, he had a pretty harsh judgment. He was not allowed to go into the promised land. But as a leader, he was held to that standard. He should have obeyed God faithfully to the point of everything God told him to do. And since Moses again failed, God judged him and Moses was not able to go in and actually see the land for himself. But in all of these failures that Moses had, what strikes me about him is that he always came back to God in genuine repentance and renewal because of that love that he had for God that was deep down inside. You know, that's not to dismiss his failures. He had pretty big failures, but he never lost that deep abiding love he had for God. And that's what he wanted the Israelites to do. He wanted them to move beyond their failures and renew the love they had for God. He knew 
That was the most important thing they could do. They needed to do more than simply follow the commands and rules God had given them. They needed to dig deep and make sure that whenever they failed God, that they would come back to Him and renew that love for Him. And they needed to love God with all of their heart, with all that they were, continuously, in order to do the things that God wanted them to do. And so that's, that's the situation that we have as they are on the eve of going in to take the land. Moses, Moses is reminding them of that important love they were to have for God, that they were to love Him beyond anyone or anything else. And Moses knew that they were already susceptible to following other gods. And so as he's about to step down from leadership, obviously since he's about to die, and the leadership is to pass over to Joshua, Moses is reminding them of what was most important, and that was to love God. But in all of that, Moses had given them the commands of God, and he wanted them to understand every command God gave was meant somehow to point the people back toward God. And that was what was most important. So today, I want to focus on the choice that Moses was laying before the Israelites that day, that he had already taught them the commands of God, and they were to go back and choose if they were going to follow those commands. So first of all, we see the choice, just were they going to follow God at all or discard all of that and simply follow other gods. But even within that choice of were they going to follow God's commands or not, there, were, there was a choice to be made there because they could either look at it as a list of do's and don'ts that would just be a religious list, that they could follow God's commands out of religious duty, or the other side of that choice was, were they going to see the commands of God as calls of God to love God and that they would let that lead them to a deeper love of God. They had to make the choice. What was it going to be? And it was a very important choice because if they chose to follow God and love God wholeheartedly, which is what the commands were meant to do, just to point back toward God, then God was going to lead them into the land. They would have success. They would drive out all of these enemy nations, and they would take the land. They would settle in it. They would plant their crops. They would build their homes. They would have a good, abundant life. They would have peace. But if they chose to not love God with all of their hearts, then by failing God's commands and that one, as the very heart of it all, God would judge them very harshly, and they would be driven out of the land. They would lose the peace. They would lose the abundance, and everything that they had been promised would be taken away because God's commands weren't meant to just simply be a religious checklist. They were meant to point back toward God and ultimately help the people love God with their entire hearts. And so... That's what I want to do today. I want us, as we look into Moses' story, to see that God's teachings in all of the Bible are meant to drive us, to point us back to Him, to help us to love Him. It's not just a matter of doing a checklist of religious things, duties, but everything God tells us is to point us back toward Him to make that right choice, the important choice, the most important choice, of loving God with all of our heart. And we're going to take a look at Moses' last words uh, of his life, basically, in these last few chapters of Deuteronomy. We're seeing the last things that Moses had the opportunity to teach the Israelites, and so Moses saw them as really important. We'll take a look at that and see what it was that Moses was teaching them. But then we're going to take a look at the same principles that Paul uses in the New Testament that God's commands are meant to point us back toward God and that Paul puts that in the context of the very gospel message, that whole message of God's love being demonstrated to us through Jesus' death and resurrection the gospel message. So we'll take a look at that this morning, but we're going to begin in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 11 through 16. 
So here's what those verses tell us as we take a look at this really important choice that is laid before us today. This command that I give you today is certainly not too difficult or beyond your reach. It is not in heaven so that you have to ask, who will go up to heaven, get it for us, and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it? And it is not across the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea, get it for us, and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it? But the message is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may follow it. See today I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. For I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in His ways, and to keep His commands, statutes, and ordinances, so that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess. So let's begin as we look at this passage and begin breaking down this message that Moses is giving the Israelites just before they go in to conquer the land. Let's take a look at what Moses was saying and what he wanted the Israelites to do. So first of all, as you think through what Moses was saying, he was saying, you know, all of these commands that I've been giving you, they may seem like a lot, but they're, they're not too difficult for you. It's not something that is going to be too hard because it's, it's like the person saying, well, you know, it's, it's not like it's up in heaven and, and I can't get to heaven to bring it down. Or like the, the guy that says, well, it's across the sea, so I, I can't cross the sea and bring it back to you. Moses was helping them to understand anyone can follow God's commands. I mean, go back and look at what he says one more time in verses 11, 12, and 13. This command that I give you today is certainly not too difficult or beyond your reach. It is not in heaven that you, so that you have to ask, who will go up to heaven, get it for us, and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it? And it is not across the sea so that you have to ask, who will cross the sea, get it for us, and proclaim it to us so that we may follow it? Moses is just simply saying, it's not too hard to understand, and it is not out of reach for anyone. That of all the Israelites, every person, that they could understand the basic point of what these commands are meant to do, and that is love God with all of their heart, with everything that they were, they needed to be committed and devoted to God. And the thing is, is that within that, there was a lot for the people to learn, but Moses wanted them to understand that God had very clearly spoken to them. And it gives us that principle that God clearly communicates what he wants. He had not done something that was so difficult, so complicated that it was out of the reach of the average person. That was not the case. And Moses was telling the Israelites, with all that I have told you of God's commands, of God's rules, of the things that God is calling you to do, understand the basic foundational part of it is something anyone can understand. And that foundational idea is to simply love God with all of your heart. Now, Moses put that in the context of two things, basically saying that there are two components of genuine faith, the mouth and the heart. Now go back to verse 14 again to see what Moses was telling the people. He said, but the message is very near you, in your mouth and in your heart, so that you may follow it. So as he was talking about the mouth and the heart, he's talking about what is the, the deepest uh, parts of their beliefs, what had really gotten down to that deepest part of who they were, not just surface ideas or things that they would say they believe, but things that they truly did believe. And I think with the mouth, he was getting to the idea of the application of it, of that would be things that they would really be ready to speak about and to live by in their life. Well, what he's doing in speaking about the mouth and the heart, he is actually just going back to what he had already taught them that we see in Deuteronomy chapter 6. We call it the Shema. And so we're seeing here, as Moses is talking about the mouth and the heart, he really is giving them the application of the Shema in, uh, from Deuteronomy chapter 6. Now the Shema, we realize that once we go to the New Testament, it's, it's just what Jesus took and applied as the great commandment. 
And here it is in Deuteronomy. And keep in mind, it's the same thing Jesus taught in the uh, book of Mark and in Matthew in the New Testament times. Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 9, the Shema. Listen, Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These words that I'm giving you today are to be in your heart. Repeat them to your children. Talk about them when you sit in your house and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Bind them as a sign on your hand and let them be a symbol on your forehead. Write them on the doorposts of your house and on your city gates. And so we see as Moses had taught this basic foundational idea that is the summary of all of the commands that God had given he is telling Israel, remember, you're serving the one and only God there is in all of creation. There isn't any other God, and you have the privilege of having been chosen by him to be his special people. So be devoted to him in everything that you do, but remember, all of his commands, everything he has given you is to simply help you love him with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. And Moses is actually helping them to see the application of that when he talks about the mouth and the heart, because he is saying, wherever you are, you need to be talking about these things that are the deepest beliefs in your life, the most important thing in your life. If it truly is the most important thing in your life, then whether you are in your house or you're walking along the streets of the town, whether you are with your children, with your neighbor, with the governor, with anyone else, you are living out these things because you're talking about them. You are putting your trust in God, loving Him in everything that you do, and it needs to be active in your life. That really is what Moses was telling the people. And I like that idea that he says, talk about them when you're lying down, when you get up with your children, when you're walking along the streets. It is the idea that they needed to be intentional about passing on faith. That if it was truly the most important thing in their life, loving God, then they needed to be passing that on to others particularly to their children, so that their children would do the same thing, to talk about it and to pass it on to their children and to keep passing it on, to keep passing it on. And I hope you've recognized already how similar this is to the New Testament things that we learn much later on, in particular messages like those of the book of James. James says, if you have genuine faith, it's going to be seen in how you live your life. That's exactly what Moses was describing in the Shema. He said, love the Lord your God with all that you are. Let it come from your heart. Let it be everything that you're speaking about all the time. Let it be clearly evident in your life because genuine faith is always seen in life. And that's what Moses wanted the people to understand that day as they were on the eve of the conquest. Remember, all of these things that God has given you, all of these commands, they may seem overwhelming, they may seem difficult, but remember what it's all about. It is all meant to point you back toward God. And it is something that is not too difficult for you. It's not that you've got to go up to the highest heavens and bring it back, or that you've got to cross the, the greatest to see and bring it back. God has given it to you already. It's in your heart. It's in your mouth. You're speaking about it, talking about it all the time. Remember, it is there for anyone and everyone, not too difficult. But Moses also that day wanted them to recognize it was important to make that choice of following God's commands so that it led them to love God deeply was the most important ch choice they would ever make. So that what we come back to, the foundational principle Moses was giving them was loving God truly is a matter of life and death. Go back with me to verses 15 and 16 once more as we look in Deuteronomy chapter 30. Here's what Moses told the people. See today, I have set before you life and prosperity, death and adversity. For I am commanding you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in his ways and to keep his commands, statutes and ordinances, 
so that you may live and multiply, and the Lord your God may bless you in the land you are entering to possess. And so we see Moses setting before the people a choice. He said, on the one hand, God is giving you the opportunity for life and prosperity, but on the other hand, he is setting before you death and adversity. And the idea is very simple. He says, when you go into the land that God is about to give you, if you will follow God's teachings and you will let that guide you to love God beyond anyone and anything else, and you do not bow down to the gods of the people that you're going to go conquer, their God's going to be there. It's going to be right in your face all the time, and you're going to be tempted to follow those gods. But if you follow the teachings of the one true God and you let that become your heart's desire, then God's going to bless you. He's going to give you victory as you go in on that military conquest. He's going to help you take the land and drive out all of those nations. He's going to help you go in and settle in that land to make a good life. He's going to help you plant your crops and have abundant harvest. He will help you to build houses and to raise your families. God will give you safety and security. He's going to give you peace and abundance if you will love him with all of your heart. But the other side is very true. There will be bad consequences if you don't. So what we see Moses teaching the people is this, that God's commands are meant to lead to what is best, that God wanted what was best for his nation. And he wanted them to see that his rules, his commands were not just religion. It wasn't just duty, but it was life itself. For them to commit to God's ways would help them love God, and loving God would lead them to the best that life had to offer, literally. But God wanted them to know that if they ignored him, if they disobeyed him, that that very act of ignoring and disobeying God would have very bad consequences as it always does, because when we ignore God, when we disobey God, it will always lead to something bad. It will lead, as Moses said, to death and adversity, to difficulty, to challenges, to, to suffering and pain. God does not want that. Now, his way may have a lot of challenges, a lot of difficulty, and even suffering of a type, but ultimately, it is what is best without exception. And Moses was telling the people, God is giving you that opportunity today. And what you choose truly is a matter of life and death. Now, let's think through not only what Moses said, but let's go to the New Testament now and see that Paul built on Moses' message. He used those same ideas, the same principles, and applied it literally and directly to the gospel message. So let's move over to the book of Romans, to Romans chapter 10, and look at verses 6 through 13 to see where, where Paul is using this passage out of Deuteronomy chapter 30. But the righteousness that comes from faith speaks like this. Do not say in your heart, who will go up to heaven? that is, to bring Christ down, or who will go down into the abyss, that is, to bring Christ up from the dead. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. For the scripture says, everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame, since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. And so you see very quickly the similarities between what Paul is saying and what Moses had to say earlier. And in fact, in the passage that we just read, you would have noticed when it came up on your screen that some of the parts of the passage were in bold print. For the Christian Standard Bible, that is a a clue to tell us those parts that are in bold print are quotes 
that are taken from the Old Testament. And so you can see, if you go back and look, that Paul had read Deuteronomy chapter 30, and he was now applying that in what we would think of as the church sense, because we are thinking Moses spoke before the time of Jesus, before the church ever began, but Paul came along later, used the same teachings from Moses and other parts of the Old Testament, and applied it to the time of the church, the life of the church. And that's exactly what he's doing here, that Paul is saying, when we think about this whole message of the gospel, the, the message of salvation, that we are saved from our sin, that we have to think of it this way, that the, we, when we come to God and we put our trust in Him, faith is not something that is beyond us. It's not to say, well, you know, if Jesus is the heart of our belief, then who's going to go up to heaven and bring Jesus down to earth so that, that we can put our trust in Him? Or it's not to say, well, you know, if Jesus died, then who's going to be able to go down to the depths of the underworld to, to death itself and raise Jesus up? Obviously, no one can do that, that we can't go up to heaven itself. We can't go down to the place of the dead and bring Jesus up from the grave. We are not able to do that. And so Paul is building, using some of the same imagery that Moses used, that is telling us when it comes to a matter of putting our faith in God and trusting in Him for salvation, we cannot be made right with God by anything we do. It is beyond us. Just as much as going up to heaven and bringing Jesus down or going down to, to the death and bringing Jesus up to life again, we can't do that. We cannot make ourselves right with God. There is nothing I can do that's going to be enough to say, God, I know that I have been separated from you by my sin, and this is what I'm going to do to make it up. And look at all these good things I've done. It just doesn't work. We can't do that, and that's exactly what Paul is telling us in this whole message of salvation. So that's where it's beginning. Paul is using Moses' teachings to say, we can't work our way to God. Faith and salvation only come by the work of God. Now here's where, again, we see another connection that Paul has with Moses because Paul talked about the mouth and the heart, just like Moses did. And it's helping us to understand that salvation has two parts that can be thought of roughly as the mouth and the heart. And so let's go back to what Paul said in Romans chapter 10 and verses 8, 9, and 10 to look at the idea of faith relating to the mouth and the heart. On the contrary, what does it say? The message is near you, in your mouth, and in your heart. This is the message of faith that we proclaim. If you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. One believes with the heart, resulting in righteousness, and one confesses with the mouth, resulting in salvation. And so Paul is talking about the heart as really the foundational part, the most important part, that faith belief is more than just knowledge. It has to truly get down to that innermost part of who we are. And the idea is that it's not just a matter of knowing facts, of knowing things, because it is possible to believe all the facts about what God has done through Jesus and still not be in a relationship with God, still not be saved from our sin. Because we can believe Jesus is God, Jesus came to earth and was born in the manger, that he lived his life, that he was crucified on the cross, that he came to life three days later. We can believe all that to be factually true, but still have it distant and not be part of us. It reaches down to the heart by faith. And so when Paul says that you have to believe in your heart, he's saying it's got to be more than just intellectual understanding. It's got to come out of a choice that you make to accept that. And that's, I think, where he's getting into the mouth 
When he talked about the mouth, it has to do with the open acceptance that flows from the heart. That we believe in the heart first, yes, that's, that's the foundational idea. But we've got to be ready to openly admit, I have accepted that message for me. I accept Jesus as my God. I realize, yes, he did take my judgment. I deserve to die for all of the wrong things that I've done for my sin. And I have believed that to be true but I have also accepted it in my heart. And so now I am ready to confess that, to tell other people, yes, Jesus is my God. He did die in my place. He did come back from the dead to give me eternal life. All of that is true, but I am saying it because I have accepted it to be mine. And that is what Paul is helping us to understand that Moses had talked about so long before. And it's not too hard for anyone. Anyone can understand those basic things, that God loves you, God wants to be in a relationship with you, sin has separated us, but through Jesus, that separation can be broken, we can be brought back in, we can be forgiven, and we can be given eternal life. That is the gospel message. Now, one of the things that's exciting and what Paul does with that from that point of talking about it's not too hard for anyone and it is available to anyone at all, regardless of who you are, Paul goes on to help us to understand that that salvation from our sin is guaranteed. Take a look at verses 11, 12, and 13 now. For Scripture says, Everyone who believes on him will not be put to shame since there is no distinction between Jew and Greek, because the same Lord of all richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. I love that passage because it's telling us that God does not turn away from anyone. Now, if you noticed in what I just read that Paul told us, he said that, God doesn't make any distinction. God doesn't make any difference between Jew or Greek. Now, for us today, that doesn't speak nearly as powerfully as it would to uh, particularly the Jewish people in Paul's day, but to the, 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 the Greek or the Gentile people as well. Because for the Jews, they only saw two types of people in the entire world, the Jewish people and the non-Jewish people, the Jews or the Greeks, the Jews or the Gentiles. And so they made a difference there, and they were very serious about that. In fact, generally, as we look at the Jewish history, they didn't think that God loved the, the people that were not Jews and they weren't important, and that's not true at all. Paul was reminding them of that foundational truth. God loves everyone. And we had to go back to that idea that God created every person in this world. And so we are reminded when it comes to a matter of the gospel message and that anyone can come to God. It means truly anyone. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter what color your skin is. It doesn't matter what culture you come from. It doesn't matter what dialect you speak. It doesn't matter what you have done in your life that you've been a good person or a bad person, we still need God. There is nothing in who you are that will say to God, you are not worthwhile. God wants every person to come to him, to know him, to be in that love relationship. That's what the gospel is all about. Jesus died so that anyone can come to him. But what we need to also recognize is that anyone who asks in faith is given eternal life. There is no exception to that. If you genuinely admit to God that you have sinned, that you need him, and that you want him, he will forgive you of everything you've ever done. There is no exception to that. Paul is reminding us that everyone who believes on God will not be put to shame. They will not find that it's not true because God will forgive every single person that comes to him in faith and give them eternal life. Now, sadly, we need to look at the other side of that message because 
everyone has the opportunity to come to God, regardless of who they are, regardless of what they've done, regardless of how bad they have been and how much they have hated God. It doesn't matter. Anyone that comes in faith and trusts in Jesus is forgiven and is given eternal life. But the other side of that is true just as well. Anyone who does not do that will be condemned. So anyone who does not ask in faith is judged, is condemned to, a, to eternity without God in torment. And I am not at all saying that to try to manipulate anyone, to try to scare anyone. I am simply relating the truth of God's Word because God has taught us repeatedly in the Bible that the choice we make between loving Him and not loving Him is vitally important. We have to make that choice in this lifetime. The Bible tells us we live our life one time, and after we live this life one time, we meet God in judgment, and God decides did we listen to his commands? Did we listen to the things that he taught and let that lead us to him, to love him in a relationship that is genuine and true, that only happens through Jesus, the gospel message? Or did we refuse that offer of love through Jesus? It is important what we choose that is what Moses was telling the Israelites that day that they stood near the Jordan River on the eve of the conquest. Moses was saying, you have a choice today. I've told you the commands. The commands of God are not just rules of do's and don'ts to follow as a religious duty. They are life and prosperity if you will choose to follow them. And that's what I encourage everyone listening today to do. Listen to God's teachings. I know some of them are hard. Some of them are confusing. There are some things in the Bible that it teaches that I just don't like, but it is truth. And if I will take God's truth and let it guide me to the place that God wants it to be, then I will learn God is a God who is worthy of love, who is worthy of devotion and praise. And that if I make that choice to love Him, I will find what is ultimately, absolutely best for my life, both now and for eternity. Now, let's think through that because God's commands are meant to lead us to God. That is the point of all of them. So how do we take this message that we've been looking at today and apply it to our lives? Well, I, I think basically as we look at what Paul has done in taking Moses' message and applying it to this famous passage about if you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth and you will be saved, then it brings me to the very gospel message and it reminds me it is important to share the gospel message. So that's what I want to challenge us to do today as we're finishing things up. And as you share this message of life, of eternal life with people around you, Please be careful to respect what others believe because not everyone is going to believe the gospel message. And we need to understand that every person is important to God. God loves every single person. And so whether we believe what they believe or not, we need to at least respect that person and their ability to choose God or not. Because if I simply go out and I begin telling people that, well, I've got the truth, everything you believe is wrong, and that is a true statement, but if I approach people that way, I'm going to drive them away and make it where the opportunity to lead them to God's truth is much less likely. So we need to begin by showing people, well, God values you, so I do too. And we can respect them and what they believe without believing the same thing. And out of that respect for who they are and what they believe, we can have the opportunity to share the truth about God's love through Jesus. But then we need to keep in mind that we have something worth sharing. We are not out to manipulate anyone. We are not out to just simply spread a religion. 
We are helping people come to know the Creator God who loved them so much He was willing to die in their place. That's what the gospel message is all about. And that is the most important thing to know in all of our life because it has to do with where we spend eternity. And it has to do with the value, the quality of life that we have right now. So keep in mind, when you share the gospel message, you have the most important message of life and you have something worth sharing. And begin by sharing what God has done in your life. You know, if, if God has changed your life, it should be clear, it should be obvious, and there should be some good reasons you have committed your life to God. So begin with that, and then carry on to, to share the truth, like Paul talked about, if you believe in your heart that God uh, sent Jesus to die in your place, and that He did raise Him from the dead, and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, that you have accepted Him as yours, and you will be saved Share those basic things. Learn some ways, the basic things that you need to share, but share them out of your own heart. Use passion. Be passionate about it, but do not use pressure. When I say that, use passion but not pressure, what I mean is we're not going to push anyone, force anyone to believe what we believe, but it's got to come from our heart. It's got to be real to me, to you, if I'm going to be sharing it with anyone else. And then out of that, just simply share the gospel in a simple, natural way. Let it come from what God has done in your life based on these Bible truths that we share clearly and obviously for people to understand so that they can, out of God's teachings, come to love the same God that we love. So thank you so much for being with me today. Let's close in prayer, and then I just have one or two little things to share with you after that. Father, thank you so much for being with us today and giving us this opportunity to hear Moses' message and then how Paul took that and applied it to the gospel. It is truly the message of life. Help us to carry that in our hearts, always to be ready to share it with others and to be able to clearly communicate the way that they can come to know you too. But Father, use us as you choose and help us to follow you in everything that we do. We pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. And as we finish out today, let me remind you that uh, we're going to continue to work online right now to, to do the uh, messages. And later on, we're going to be getting our studies going again online uh, since we still in Bangkok cannot meet together physically. But pray for us that we'll be able to do the best we can with the online technology. And as part of that, let me encourage you to continue to give your tithes and your offerings. It has been a difficult time for, for everyone financially, and the church needs to continue to do our ministries. And so I ask you to, to consider that, to pray what God would lead you to give in your tithes and your offerings. You can find the way to do that online uh, through our Facebook or our Calvary uh, website. Either one will give you the basic things to do to give those tithes and offerings. But most of all, thank you for being with us today and continue to be sharing that message of God's love as you go. Thank you so much. Bye-bye.